My name is Professor Tomila Lankina. I am a, a scholar of international relations at the International Relations Department here at LSE. And it gives me tremendous honor and pleasure to welcome here Professor Mark Beisinger, who will be talking about his award-winning book, uh, The Revolutionary City. Uh, Professor Mark Weisinger is Henry Putnam Professor of Government in the Department of Politics at Princeton University. He is the author of three highly acclaimed single authored uh, books and several edited volumes. Among his previous books is Nationalist Mobilization and the Collapse of the Soviet State, which won a whole host of really top, most prestigious awards in comparative politics. Um, and, and government, and his most recent book, The Revolutionary City, which we'll be discussing today, has won the highly coveted and perhaps the most prestigious book award in comparative politics, the Gregory, Gregory Lubert Award uh, of the Comparative Politics Section of the American Political Science Association for best book in comparative po politics published over the previous two years. Uh, Mark has also published dozens of uh, articles, and I should say that his previous book, not to say, not to mention that the latest one, has inspired, hugely inspired the younger generation of scholars like myself, who was just finishing a PhD when Mark's earlier book appeared, and um, it's a real tour de force, and it really ins uh, is and it was an inspiration for scholars like myself working on mobilization and uh, protest. I'm also tremendously honored and pleased to welcome Professor Olga Onuch, who is the first ever holder of a full professorship in Ukrainian politics in the English-speaking world, and um, is at University of Manchester, the first English language, uh, the first professor of Ukrainian politics at an English um, language university. Uh, she's a scholar of comparative politics of uh, Eastern Europe, and we, are, those of us who are working on protests also know her incredible first book, uh, Mapping Mass Mobilization, and most recently, together with Professor Henry Hale, she has co-authored a book called The Zelensky Effect, which has been reviewed across a wide spectrum of um, newspaper news and uh, other uh, press outlets, the New York Times, uh, the Diplomatic Courier, the Guardian, Washington Post, uh, the Times Radio, Radio Post podcast has also featured it. So I'm incredibly delighted to welcome these two outstanding scholars. Let me also mention that Mark's book is available for signing and for purchase, and, and he's happy to sign it right after this talk. There is a little stall. So those of you who haven't had a chance to, uh, to purchase that book, please do so. It is one of those books, and I have my own copy here, which is a kind of book you want to actually own. You know, And, and the book I have is all covered in notes because it's an absolute uh, master course in how to do uh, comparative uh, politics. So the t hashtag for this event, in case you're tweeting, is hashtag LSC Revolutionary City, and the fire exits should be clearly marked. I should also mention that this event is recorded, and there'll be both online and offline audience. Um, so we will have some questions, both from you here and the whole end from our online audience. So uh, with this, I would like to invite Mark to... Um, Okay, well, uh, thank you, uh, Tamila, for that kind introduction, and thank you for the invitation uh, to come here. Can you all hear me? Okay. Uh, thanks for Ol to Olya for taking the time to read the book carefully, to give me some comments. Actually, a long, long time ago, I, was, I served on her Viva committee, uh, gave her tough questions, and now she has the opportunity to give them back to me. So. <laughs> uh, so I was supposed to be here a year ago uh, to talk about this book. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't make it because there was a strike at LSE, and it didn't seem to me that it was quite right for me to talk about protest while crossing a picket line. 
Uh, so I postponed, and this was the time uh, you know, that I could make it and eventually made it here, of course. But as you can see, uh, you know, this is a big book, uh, physically big book, but it also, I think, has a lot in it. Um, you know, I started this book uh, in 2010. It took me a long time to write it. Uh, I was invited to uh, a, a workshop by a group of historians. Uh, it was supposed to be a workshop on blank spots and our understanding of revolutions. And they asked me uh, to uh, address uh, the role of violence in revolution. And undoubtedly, uh, like you, uh, I believe that revolutions had been becoming less violent, less deadly over time. Uh, but, you know, the fact is, is that we didn't really have any data to be able to show that. There was data out there on civil wars, but not on revolutions more broadly. Um, and so I spent some time in the library trying to see how difficult it would be to collect that kind of information. And I came away from that experience uh, believing that uh, a knowledge of global patterns of rebellion has a lot to teach us about how uh, the ways in which populations challenge rulers from below uh, have altered over time. So that's what the book is essentially about. Uh, the book examines the evolution of political revolutions over more than a century. It treats revolution as a distinct mode of regime change from below, uh, one that differs from coups or foreign invasions that are aimed at regime change. Uh, in, that a revol in a revolution, a government is laid siege to not by a foreign army, not by its own army, but by its own, pop own civilian population. So I define a revolution, um, as you can see here, uh, as a mass siege of an established government by its own population with the goals of displacing the incumbent regime and substantially altering the political or social order. That's similar to the ways in which revolution is widely discussed within what's called the contentious politics literature today, literature that focuses on, on protest and revolutions, particularly when, within political science and sociology. So I argue, uh, that all regimes come with two goals. Uh, one is to attain power, and the other is to achieve uh, substantial political or social change after power. And you can't do the latter without you know, first doing the former. Uh, and so we also need to analyze those things as separate types of phenomena. That is, a revolution can come to power, but not necessarily exercise a, a big effect on what happens afterwards. So there are, there is of course, uh, you know, a vast literature on revolutions. Uh, within that literature, this book is somewhat distinct in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, it's global scope. It deals with revolutions around the world. Uh, it attempts to theorize the spatial dimensions uh, of revolution and the city as a spatial site of revolt, and I'll talk a lot about that today. Uh, it focuses on the processes of revolution, the outcomes of revolution, and the consequences of revolution. That is all three aspects of revolution that we care about. Uh, it integrates structure and agency into a broader probabilistic understanding of causation, which is somewhat different than the ways in which people have talked about revolutions in the past. It is multidisciplinary. Uh, it is multi-method. Uh, and it brings to bear new sources of information to the study of revolution that really haven't been available before. So in that regard, uh, the book is based on three streams of information. Uh, first, over uh, the six years that followed my initial forays into the library, I ended up assembling a data set of 345 revolutionary episodes uh, around the world uh, from 1900 to 2014. Uh, the data is actually available for you to use if you want to. It's on my website. You can download it. There are also cases there that fell short of my definition uh, that you can access and take a look at. So there are really no comparable records uh, of revolution, though I'd say that that kind of information is sorely needed uh, to be able to place any individual case into a broader context uh, or for uh, understanding global patterns. 
So the, as I said, the data are available for you to use. Uh, the book also use, uses uh, a series of uh, unusual public opinion surveys that probe uh, individual level participation in four revolutions, uh, the 2004 Orange Revolution in Ukraine, uh, the 2010 Tunisian Revolution, the 2011 Egyptian Revolution, and the 2013 Euromaidan Revolution in Ukraine. Uh, th those represent examples of the new urban revolutionary repertoire that plays a central role in the book uh, and that's grown more common, uh, as I'll show uh, in a minute, around the world in recent decades. So most of what we know about revolutionary participation comes from lists of those who are arrested or those who are killed. Uh, it tends to be very thin information, maybe where they were born, when they were born, what their occupation was. These surveys allow you to probe uh, much more deeply into uh, participation than has ever been done before, really. Uh, and not only that, but it allows you to do it for those who participated in the revolution, those who supported the revolution but didn't participate, and those who opposed the revolution, as well as those who remained apathetic and didn't care. So, and they also, one of the things about them is they, in, they contain an incredible degree of detail. Uh, not only information about political attitudes and behaviors, but also about things like consumer goods ownership. Uh, whether the person visited the gym in the last week, or a mosque, or a church, uh, you know, their height, their weight, their drinking habits, their smoking habits, uh, many, many other aspects of their lives. It's an incredible, these are incredible records, uh, unique records in some ways. Uh, about uh, revolutionary participation. And here's an example of some of the things actually that you can find out uh, about it. I won't repeat them here. but So finally, uh, the book uses extensive uh, case material uh, from numerous revolutions around the world in order to drill down to the events uh, and interactions that occur within revolutions as well as the spaces within which they occur. Um, and, of course, in a presentation like this, I'm not going to be able to recount a lot of that to you, but you have to trust me uh, that that material is, in fact, there. So the revolutionary city essentially tells the story of how the concentration of people, power, and wealth in cities has affected uh, the incidents, practice, and consequences of political revolutions around the world. And as you know, the scale of urbanization over the past century uh, has been nothing less than spectacular. Uh, in 1900, 13% of the world's population was urban, and only 13 cities around the world had more than a million inhabitants. Uh, by 2023, 57% of the world's population was urban, and 579 cities had more than a million inhabitants. So this has really transformed uh, the nature of our world, spatially, but also in terms of lifestyle, uh, and social forces. So as the book argues, that transformation has had a very profound effect on the ways in which people challenge regimes from below. For one thing, uh, it's played a major role in rendering obsolete revolution's most theorized form. If you were to go and look at the literature on revolution, uh, you would see that uh, that was social revolutions. There's a lot of literature out there on social revolutions which stayed a scotch pole, uh, it in, fact, in fact wrote the classic work uh, in her formulation. Uh, social revolutions were rooted in what she called agrarian bureaucratic society. Agrarian bureaucratic society. So she argues that agrarian bureaucratic society is a social formation in which control over and extraction of resources from peasants depended on a coordination between a semi-bureaucratic state uh, and a landed upper class. Uh, and most theories of social revolution revolved around some aspect of this agrarian bureaucratic society and the conditions under which it produced revolution. However, by the late 20th century, uh, that agrarian bureaucratic world was rapidly fading. It was fading under the impact of urbanization, uh, development, and political change, and with it so did social revolutions, as you can see here. At the same time, 
Urbanization gave rise to new patterns of revolt in cities. So prior to 1985, 70% of revolutionary episodes uh, in cities were armed. Since 1985, 73% of revolutionary cities, uh, revo excuse me, revolutions in cities have been unarmed. So there's been a transformation in the nature of rebellion within cities. Uh, and uh, revolution in cities has come to be based on the power of numbers rather than the power of arms, what I call in the book the urban civic uh, revolutionary repertoire. So the book explores the rising incidence of these urban civic revolutions, uh, how they've fueled a growth in revolutionary contention around the world and have increased the odds of opposition success. It looks at the processes they involve and the consequences that they bring about. So to tie all that together, uh, I develop a spatial theory of revolution, a spatial theory that's rooted in the differences between revolutionary processes in cities uh, and revolutionary processes in the countryside. And I argue that those differences are closely related to the role of cities as centers of state and economic power. Revolutionary challenges in cities take place precisely where the coercive capacity of the state is strongest making them highly vulnerable to repression. But cities are also where regimes are most vulnerable due to the thickened presence of government nerve centers of power. That's where the nerve centers of power that revolutionaries want to capture, that's where they're located. So the goal of all revolutions is to capture those nerve centers of power. So in this sense, proximity of revolt to centers of power magnifies both the stakes the, the stakes and the risks of revolution for both rebels and regimes. So I refer to that as the proximity dilemma in revolution. It's a trade-off uh, between repression and disruption that's associated with proximity to centers of power. And I use that trade-off as the basic frame for understanding revolutionary processes and how they've evolved over time. So there's an analogous trade-off uh, that exists in nature, uh, what evolutionary biologists call the growth versus predation risk trade-off. And in that trade-off, the most efficient sites for animals to feed are also the most dangerous sites uh, for them to fall to predators, because predators also con congregate in those same sites. So, uh, individual members of a species navigate that trade-off differently, uh, but they seek somehow to balance the risks and rewards. Animals may, for, for example, uh, alter where and how long they feed or the timing of feeding. Uh, they may devote more time to vigilance than to feeding. Um, you know, this trade-off can also lead to developing special uh, camouflage or escape capabilities over time. So for instance, uh, you, you see similar kinds of things in revolution itself. The revolutionary uh, repression disruption trade-off can similarly be managed, for instance, by spatial relocation. Uh, by moving further away from government centers of power, uh, a revolutionary opposition can better avoid government repression, but it does so uh, at the expense of its repressive efficiency. So the most, uh, excuse me, yeah, it's, it's disruptive efficiency. The most efficient places for, its, for it to disrupt are precisely the most dangerous places for them to be. So the repression disruption trade-off can also be managed through learning behavior, specifically through tactical choice by regimes and oppositions, tactics that increase an opposition's ability to disrupt or decrease its exposure to a regime's uh, uh, repressive capacity are likely to be more effective uh, at inducing regime change, while government tactics that increase uh, opposition exposure to a regime's repressive capacity or decrease its ability to disrupt are likely to be more effective at repressing revolutionary challenges. And finally, like the effects of climate change on natural selection, the slope of this repression disruption trade-off itself can move. It can change over time. It can be affected 
in a more favorable direction for regimes or a more favorable direction for opposition. So in this graph, you see uh, x sub 0 is the trade-off function. There are other trade-off functions potentially possible here, x sub 1 or x sub 2. And those types of structural changes uh, occur as a result uh, of changes in the environment that render uh, oppositions more or less exposed uh, to repression or more or less vulnerable to disruption, uh, to opposition to disruption. So changes like shifts in the nature of political and economic power, evolving social structures or networks, uh, new technologies of rebellion uh, or counterinsurgency, new forms of communication, or shifting currents of geopolitics. So I, as I argue in the book, these structural changes uh, are usually more intensely felt in cities. They're more intensely felt in cities uh, which are more exposed to technological innovations, changes in the character of government, and global economic and geopolitical forces. But urbanization has also altered this repression uh, disruption uh, trade-off more directly by concentrating large numbers of people uh, in close proximity to centers of power, connecting them in new ways, and producing new spaces and social forces uh, for challenging regimes. So this proximity dilemma has shaped uh, revolutionary contention in some profound ways. For one thing, uh, violence has opposite effects in rural and urban revolutions. So in rural revolutions, more violence is associated with a higher likelihood of opposition victory. Uh, in cities, precisely the opposite is true. Um, in the countryside, armed rebels can hide from government re retaliation, but as Engels uh, recognized already in this quote I provided you from 1895, uh, in cities, uh, Armed rebels are exposed to the full repressive capacity of the state. Rebels are outgunned, outnumbered, and outmatched uh, by government forces. This proximity dilemma has also been one of the key reasons why social revolutions, uh, which until the early 20th century occurred almost exclusively as armed rebellions in cities, uh, by the middle of the 20th century came to be waged predominantly from the countryside. As the state's firepower increased, the old-fashioned way of making uh, social revolution through armed revolt in cities had a very low rate of success. Uh, but beginning in the 1920s, and particularly connected with the Chinese Revolution, uh, but this accelerated during uh, the Cold War, a ruralization of social revolution took place. As social revolutionaries migrated to the countryside, where they used distance from government centers and rough terrain to hide from government retaliation. Essentially, social revolutions traded capacity to disrupt for safety from government repression. And as a result of that move to the countryside from the city, uh, peasants who were once thought to be reactionary and focused entirely on access to land uh, became uh, the new social force underpinning social revolution. They discovered peasants as a revolutionary force. So the proximity dilemma also helps explain why numbers actually don't matter that much in the outcomes of rural revolutions. So generating numbers uh, is more difficult in rural revolutions given the low population densities, but it's also the case that crowds in the countryside don't present much of a direct threat to regimes. They're located far from government centers of power. By contrast, in cities, Large crowds are not only easier to assemble, but they can also threaten regimes more directly. So large unarmed revolts in cities can potentially fend off regime repression, disrupt core uh, regime activities. They can provoke defections from a regime's ruling coalition. Uh, so if armed revolution in cities faces a low probability of success due to the overwhelming coercive power of the state in cities, Revolution in cities that relies on the power of numbers has performed a lot better. And as I show uh, in this graph in particular, uh, however, that there are strongly diminishing returns to numbers in cities. Particularly, you can see that on the graph on the right. Strongly diminishing returns. 
you have to mobilize a lot of people in cities in order to have better than a 50-50 chance of winning, 50-50 being the toss of a coin, right? So it's only at extremely high numbers that the odds are truly tip. And you can see here the confidence intervals, they actually uh, only approach the 50-50 line at very, very high levels. So essentially, the movement of hundreds of millions of people into cities over the past century rendered possible new repertoires uh, for rebellion uh, in cities based on the power of numbers rather than the power of arms. So take, for instance, uh, the city of Kiev, which sadly uh, today finds itself subject to rocket attacks. Uh, but Kiev experienced multiple uh, revolutionary uprisings over the past 120 years. Over that time, the ways in which revolt occurred shifted from reliance on arms to reliance on numbers. Now the fact is, is that Kiev in 1905 could not have engaged in the kind of uh, revolution by numbers uh, that occurred at the time of the Orange Revolution in 2004. The size of the city was too small, 330,000 people. Uh, not only would you have to have mobilized every single person, you know, man, woman, and child, uh, which was impossible, of course, uh, but you would have had to deploy them and uh, against uh, you know, armed force in cities. Now, by contrast, by 2004, Kiev's population consisted of 2.6 million people. That's eight times its population in 1905. And that provided a propitious base for mobilizing up to a million people uh, it, during the Orange Revolution in 2004. So as I detail in the book, there were other reasons why the power of numbers was not an available strategy uh, before the 20th century. So governments at the beginning of the 20th century were significantly more likely to ride over crowds uh, or to shoot into them uh, than it is today. So uh, deaths in unarmed rebellions um, you know, in the first half of the 20th century were on average six times greater uh, than they are today. Uh, as a you know, result, participants in revolutionary demonstrations frequently had to arm themselves. So there was an incentive to arm yourself uh, in cities. Uh, but I also show uh, that um, you know, the widespread application of so-called non-lethal technologies of crowd control from the middle of the 20th century on led to a reduction in the number of fatalities that occurred uh, in urban revolutions. Uh, and it made unarmed revolt in cities much more feasible. Then, you know, there are the technologies that people used for coordinating large crowds. So in the early 20th century, these were quite primitive. They were limited in their reach. Not until the Nazis uh, applied sound amplification to street rallies in the 1930s uh, could people hear speakers at rallies at more than a distance of about 10 meters. And due to the constraints of communication systems, revolutionary movements in cities tended to rely on highly localized networks, neighborhood networks. Um, you know, the introduction in the late 20th century, uh, technological innovations, the proliferation of large, resourced, and networked uh, populations in close proximity to the state's nerve centers of power, connected through modern communications, that altered the, all of the possibilities uh, for uh, making revolution by numbers. It pushed that repression disruption function in a particular direction. So that's the essence of what I call the urban civic revolution, that is uprisings that seek to overthrow abusive governments by mobilizing as many people as possible in a concentrated period of time, relying on the power of numbers rather than the power of arms, uh, street fighting, uh, strikes or urban rioting. So since 1985, urban civic revolutions have constituted two-fifths of all revolutionary episodes around the world. They're three-fifths of all urban revolutions. They are the predominant form of urban revolution today. Uh, prior to 1985, 55% of revolutionary episodes occurred predominantly in the countryside. Since 1985, two-thirds of revolutionary episodes have occurred predominantly in cities. So, Revolution has become a predominantly urban phenomenon today, and not only that, but among the urban revolutions, it has been predominantly urban civic, relying on the power of numbers 
uh, rather than the power of arms. So by bringing these large numbers uh, closer to the nerve centers of power, uh, by creating su uh, cities of sufficient size uh, to be able to utilize the power of numbers, by connecting them together in new ways, by producing new urban uh, social forces uh, participating in revolutions, uh, urbanization has also led to a growth in the frequency of revolutionary contention around the world. And as I show in the book, this increased frequency of revolutionary contention has been driven by the proliferation of urban revolutions and specifically by the proliferation of these urban civic revolutions uh, rooted in the power of numbers. So much of the book is devoted to understanding the implications of that return of revolution to the city uh, and the rise of the urban civic repertoire. So for instance, uh, as the proximity uh, dilemma might anticipate, rural revolutions and social revolutions are closely associated with state weakness, with weak states, uh, and in particular with what Michael Mann uh, called weak uh, infrastructural power, the inability of states to penetrate their own territory. Urban and urban civic revolutions are not associated with man's infrastructural power. Uh, they occur precisely where the state is strongest. They don't hide from state power. They confront state power directly, which is a fundamental difference between urban and rural revolutions. So in one of the uh, book's chapters, uh, I show that uh, I, I develop a probabilistic model of the onset of urban civic revolutions, and I use that model to show the factors that map onto urban civic revolutions and that they don't map onto rural revolutions or social revolutions. Um, and, you know, Theta Scotchpole basically said much the same thing. She said that no universal theory of revolutions, or the causes of revolutions at least, is possible. Uh, simply because of the diversity of purposes that revolutions have been put over time, the varied social forces involved in changing world historical circumstances. So unlike social revolutions, which were shaped by poverty and land inequality and state infrastructural weakness, uh, contemporary urban revolutions are more closely related to the coercive and predatory power of the state. They're much more sensitive to regime type they generally materialize against regimes that are more autocratic, uh, more personalist, more repressive, uh, more corrupt than the regimes that experienced uh, social revolutions or rural revolutions. So across the world, urban dwellers have shown uh, a particular concern about issues of government corruption. So the World Value Survey, uh, for instance, shows that inhabitants of very large cities, cities with more than 500,000 inhabitants, are much less likely to believe that it's justifiable to bribe an official uh, than our rural inhabitants, uh, even controlling for gender, age, uh, and education of respondents as well as country fixed effects. So viewed in that light, it's not surprising that many of the grievances uh, that permeate these urban civic revolutions revolve around reclaiming the public sphere uh, from uh, corrupt, arbitrary, and despotic governments. So essentially, as societies have urbanized and moved closer to centers of state power, and as states proliferated and consolidated, the state came to matter more in people's lives. In cities, populations came into more regular contact with the state, including, of course, the state's unequal capacity for predation and oppression. Now, I use this you know, model, this probabilistic model, to examine the roles played by structure and agency in the outbreak of urban civic revolutions. And this statistical model actually performs pretty well. It correctly predicts uh, a, you know, above average risk for 80% of the cases in which a revolutions, urban civic revolutions actually did occur. But as I show, this structural model also seriously overpredicts revolutions, even in the presence of potential triggering events like financial crises or elections or wars. So I use a series of 16 case studies. I use the model's predictions of risk to assess why revolution did or did not emerge where structural risk was high, uh, showing 
the importance of regime uh, opposition interactions in the materialization of revolution. So to put this in context, until now, the key analogies that have dominated the study of revolution have been earthquakes, which suddenly erupt due to the buildup of structural pressures, or wildfires, uh, which unexpectedly, unexpectedly flare up due to some exogenous triggering event. Now, by contrast, I liken revolutions to hurricanes. Now, I know you don't get too many of them here in London, uh, but typically, Hurricanes begin you know, as small tropical disturbances over the ocean uh, due to the interaction between the warm surface water and the upper atmosphere. However, it's the case that only a small proportion of these disturbances ever develop into major storms, somewhere between one and two percent. And only half of those one and two percent, only half of those ever really reach hurricane strength. So as scientists have shown, this outcome is the product of interactive processes. Interactive processes. In particular, the effect of vertical wind shear. Too much vertical wind shear uh, breaks these uh, tropical disturbances apart. Moreover, many hurricanes that do develop never reach land. Some die out at sea, but others, of course, slam into uh, continents and cause enormous damage. So I argue that this kind of combination between structural conduciveness uh, and interaction, uncertain emergence, is how we need to think about revolutions. Uh, they occur probabilistically. They actually occur where we would expect them to occur. They don't occur entirely by accident. Uh, but there are plenty of instances in which they fail to develop, even in the presence of conducive structural conditions and potential strict triggers. And, the dynamic interactions that occur between oppositions and regimes play a critical role in determining whether that tropical disturbance uh, grows into a full-scale hurricane or dies out far at sea. So the book then delves into the revolutionary episode. It dissects the processes that occur within urban revolutions and how those compare with revolutionary contention in the countryside. Uh, because proximity to centers of power heightens the risk of revolution for all involved, urban revolutions are highly condensed conflicts. They take place over the course of days and weeks rather than over the course of years, as is true of rural uh, rebellions. So that compression of time in urban revolutions creates significant information problems for regimes and oppositions, similar to what in the game of chess is called Zeitnot, or time trouble. You know, the pressure of the clock that causes people to make errors. So that increases the likelihood, this compression of time in urban revolutions, increases the likelihood of, of human error in urban revolutionary contention. But not only is the error more likely in urban revolutionary contention, but it's also more consequential for outcomes because it occurs in close proximity to government centers of power. So oppositions are highly vulnerable to repression if they make an error, or governments are highly vulnerable to being overthrown if they make an error. Now, mistakes occur in rural revolutions too, all the time. Um, but rural revolutions, they have a kind of punctuated character to them, you know, that revolves around the battle. Um, and those battles can be you know, confusing and mistake prone but they're more forgiving. Rural revolutions are more forgiving because of the remoteness of the state, the distance uh, from the state, the impenetrability of terrain. And in most instances, uh, those provide for a buffer for rebels and for regimes to recover from mistakes. In urban revolutions where errors occur close to uh, government centers of power, close to its concentrated government's concentrated coercive force and its nerve centers of power, and I show this through numerous examples in the book, uh, that that heightens the impacts of human error on outcomes in urban revolutions. So in urban revolutions, not only are errors more frequent, but their consequences are more direct uh, and immediate. The book then contrasts the spatial dimensions of rebellion in rural revolts uh, and uh, urban armed revolts with those in 
urban civic revolutions based on the power of numbers. So in contrast to urban armed revolts, which treat the cityscape as if it were rough terrain, and they use it to provide protection against government attack, urban civic revolutions attempt to take advantage of the spaces between buildings. They empty space of the public square uh, and the boulevard to mobilize large numbers to disrupt political and commercial life. They don't hide from government repression. They occur in full view of the government and in full view of the world, including in full view of the police, of course. In centrally located spaces in close proximity to centers of power. So visibility is one of the key features of the urban environment that they seek to exploit. And with the rise of television and the internet uh, and uh, you know, simultaneity, uh, visuality, transnationality, all of these have become increasingly important uh, to urban revolutionary processes. Oh, here we go. Hold on, got to go back. Hopefully. Yeah, there we are. So as states have proliferated and consolidated, and as urbanization has proceeded, these large open spaces uh, in close proximity to centers of power in the world have proliferated, especially in capital cities. So Kiev's Maidan, for instance, uh, developed into a vast revolutionary space in part due to the destruction uh, of the city during World War II and the ways in which the communist uh, regime rebuilt the area uh, as a way of glorifying the Soviet government for parades. Uh, so in the book, I examine the making and remaking of this revolutionary space over time. I also explore how the shape of that space, the location of that space, uh, the availability and symbolic value of that public space affects the, the interactions between regimes and oppositions during revolutionary contention. You know, as rural counterinsurgency doctrine emphasizes, uh, in rural revolutions, it's not control over space, uh, but control over the so-called hearts and minds, that is, over the populations that inhabit that space. Uh, that matters for determining outcomes. Now, by contrast, for urban civic revolutions, uh, you know, that depend on the power of numbers, it's less control over populations and more control over public space. So the key tactic for undermining urban civic revolutions is to control urban public space, particularly urban public space in close proximity to government nerve centers of power, to dislocate those challenges and to push them off into the periphery of the city. So the book then descends even further. You can see why it's a big book. Uh, it descends even further to the level of the individual, the individuals participating in these revolutions, using the survey data that I mentioned before. Uh, and as I show, revolutionary processes that concentrate hundreds of thousands in central urban spaces in a matter of days or weeks, as these urban civic revolutions do, they necessarily draw on a very wide variety of grievances uh, and political forces. In order to maximize numbers in a concentrated period of time, these revolutions typically forge a broad negative coalition. Uh, they, it's forged in a very makeshift manner, often pulling in all who favor the removal of the incumbent regime, irrespective of purpose and political beliefs. They rely on these hastily assembled coalitional leaderships, and sometimes no leadership at all. Uh, they use an inclusive civic nationalism in order to mobilize as many people as possible, and broadly civic demands, minimalist demands, of reclaiming state power uh, and uh, uh, re state power from these corrupt and abusive regimes. So it's a kind of least common denominator that can mobilize as many people as possible. So unlike social revolutions, which are typically led by hierarchical organizations, uh, the leadership of urban civic revolutions have neither the desire nor the opportunity to socialize participants in a common set of values. Uh, and the surveys show, in fact, that participants in these revolutions are more diverse in their political identities and in their political opinions uh, on key public policy issues than either those who support the revolution but don't participate or those who oppose the revolution. So urban civic revolutions are often interpreted as democratic revolutions, but there are a number of reasons why 
I hesitate to call them that. So for one thing, there have been many revolutions espousing liberal aims that don't rely on the power of numbers. In fact, uh, revolutions espousing liberal aims up through the middle of the 20th century were mostly armed revolts. Uh, but more importantly, uh, as the surveys show, corruption and economic issues were most frequently cited by participants uh, as reasons for why they participated in these revolutions, while the desire for political freedoms was cited by only a minority. So not surprisingly, uh, participants in these revolutions uh, demonstrate a weak commitment to liberal democratic values. So 66% of Orange Revolution participants and 62% of Euromaidan participants agreed with the statement, several strong leaders can do more for our country than laws and discussions. 33% of Orange Revolution participants and 52% of Euromaidan participants believe that Ukraine, only, only that number believed Ukraine needed a multi-party system. Now, I don't know the democracy that doesn't have a multi-party system, but maybe you can point some out to me. 63% of participants in the 2011 Egyptian revolution considered providing basic food items or narrowing the gap between uh, rich and poor as the most important feature of a democracy. But only 10% of participants uh, in, Egyptian, in the Egyptian revolution considered the opportunity to change their government uh, or the freedom to criticize the government as the most important features of a democracy. So participants in these revolutions often have uh, a weak commitment uh, to democratic values. These revolutions are more about what people are struggling against than what they're struggling for. And that's important to understand. So generally speaking, revolutions don't produce democracies. It's what happens after revolution uh, that determines whether a democracy develops. So one of the contributions of the book is its systematic comparison of post-revolutionary developments. It compares patterns of political order, economic growth, inequality, political freedoms, and government accountability after revolutions. And I show, for instance, that successful urban civic revolutions uh, do lead to substantial improvements in political freedoms and government accountability relative to pre-revolutionary regimes. But as I also show, these, those achievements fall short of average levels of electoral democracies minimally defined, minimally defined over the past century. And they tend to deteriorate somewhat over the subsequent years. Also, in terms of the rule of law, uh, these regimes fall far below uh, the average levels uh, of electoral democracies. Again, they're improvements on their pre-revolutionary regimes but they fall below the level that you would call democratic. Also, more importantly, these regimes don't push aside the state, these new regimes, these revolutions. Rather, they inherit the state, the pre-revolutionary state intact, with all of its embedded uh, relationships of corruption. And as a result, corruption re remains at very high levels after these revolutions. In fact, about at the same level as pre-revolutionary the pre-revolutionary regimes, um, and uh, certainly far below, or excuse me, far higher corruption uh, than you would find um, in the average electoral democracy. Uh, also, uh, these revolutions produce uh, gradually a kind of uh, crisis of sluggish economic growth that develops over time. Um, not there immediately. Their immediate economic effect is minimal, but often because of the baggage that they inherit, uh, they develop, uh, they tend to develop uh, crises of economic growth. And finally, uh, these revolutions are extreme, because they're extremely compact uh, and involve these hastily constructed uh, negative coalitions because they rely on the power of numbers, they produce post-revolutionary governments that are more fractious, less durable than governments brought to power uh, by social revolutions. And as you can see from this survival analysis of post-revolutionary regimes, revolutions that occur within a highly compressed period of time tend to produce post-revolutionary regimes that don't last that long in power. Um, whereas those that, that unfold over a protracted period of time uh, last much longer. And this relationship holds even when you control for revolutionary ideology or the degree of lethal violence involved. 
So three out of every five successful urban uh, civic revolutions experienced two months or less uh, of revolutionary contention. So sp uh, statistically speaking, those new regimes had less than a 50-50 chance of lands la lasting more than six years. So you can think Tunisia, for instance. Okay, so that gives you a sense, a taste of some of the things I deal with in this book. Uh, you know, my goals in writing this book uh, were to explain how and why revolutions have evolved over time, to develop a theory, a spatial theory, uh, for understanding that, uh, and that's relevant for the urban world in which we now live, uh, to elucidate these spatial dimensions of rebellion, and to bring to bear uh, new forms of information about revolutions that would help us understand revolutionary phenomena in a new way. And hopefully I've piqued your interest uh, in learning a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. I'm sure people have lots of questions, but please hold on because we have uh, Professor Olga Ono who will be offering some comments and possibly even some critiques. How many, of, how many minutes do I have? Uh, maybe five, ten. And then we'll I will do it in five to ten, but you might have to cut my mic now. <laughs> well, Mark, is the Peterloo Massacre a rural social revolution type thing, no. or is it one of the first urban? Uh, it was urban, uh, and uh, you know I don't know if it was uh, if you would say that the, that it was a social revolution that it had turned uh, revolutionary per se, but. Social revolution in the 19th century and early 20th century was predominantly an urban phenomenon because that's where the government was and that's where the social forces you know, that were trying to make revolution were concentrated often, although in the Peterloo, many people came in obviously from the countryside. Uh, but it was really only in the mid 20th century that, that social revolution ruralized. It's out of the scope of the data set, but I was dying to ask because of course I am a professor at Manchester and the Peterloo is a big deal. In fact, the Peterloo, uh, which took place in what is now the city center of Manchester, it has this weird dynamic, right? It's 1819, and it's known as the first mass mobilization, pro-democracy, Mark, pro-democracy mass mobilization in, on record, okay? And it does, a, it, 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 it does a lot of looking at it as a case study through what you offer us in, in this book. I think would be particularly interesting. For those of you who don't know, look it up. It's an interesting case to get to know, and there's been some interesting films about it and so on. But now let's get to the tour de force that is this book. My goodness, yes, it, there is just as much in there and more as, as Mark has described. The appendices, I don't know how you got your uh, publishers to agree to so many and so <laughs> many graphs and tables and so on. That is always a battle and uh, it's all in there. It's phenomenal. It is, uh, for the, the nerds in us, it is a page turner like you've never seen. Um, but also it is, it is exceptional. There's very few works that are comparative in nature like this that do such a rigorous detailed job and yet at the same time offer vignettes about places and people and events that folks who do study those places and people and events will see as, as authentic, as someone who got it. And that's, that's, that's really difficult to do in, in, in one book. And may I one day be able to do that in one of my um, books. So I, you know, I read this multiple times. I read it also through different uh, stages. I read sections through different stages of its development. When it was out, I immediately assigned it to my course. My, und my undergrads weren't as pleased about the size of the book, I have to say, but it's, it's there. It is, it is both deeply historicized uh, as it is empirically rich. The data set alone will be something that social scientists will use for decades to come and if, those, if you are interested in doing some dissertation work, this is an incredible resource for you that it's available. Not everyone makes things like this available uh, publicly. So that, is, that in itself is an example of, of excellent scholarship in terms of the rigor and empiric uh, nature of the data set, but also that it's open and available for people to use. And I, that, that, is, that should be commended because not everyone does that.
And it does a really good job at seriously questioning some myths and colloquialisms or, or, uh, about rev revolution, revolutionary episodes, right? So some of the things that you already might have thought about uh, revolutionary episodes becoming less or more violent over time. Are we seeing fewer of them than we have in the past? All these things are debunked in this book in such a way that, you know, gosh, there's a lot of red-faced folks out there. Um, the detail, the rigor, the analysis, the major contributions. Um, comparison over time and space. Very rarely is that done so well. Addressing the different types of revolutionary episodes in a way that I think is confronting for the discipline for those who study, and I think that will have a huge impact on future scholarship. I really like uh, the theorization of the repression-disruption trade-off. I think that's going to be one of those things that so many people will come to say in their many, many essays and articles in the future, and it will be that thing that will be associated um, also with your work that... Uh, you know, and people will say it without actually knowing what it's really about. <laughs> and that's when you know it has a real impact. In They'll distort it. Right? Yes, yeah. yes. I'm sorry, but it's going to happen. Yeah. Because it, it, that's, that is a, just a, a fascinating um, part to read. And the spatial theory of revolution, revolution. And I think more work on this should happen because I think this is uh, one of the next avenues uh, for people to go further into this and beyond. In a crude way, urbanization matters. It matters for a variety of reasons, many of them that have been already aligned, but it matters because of the networks and the network scope it develops among social interactions, people, individuals, right? It matters because the interactions of daily life, let alone social and political life and economic life change. It matters because of the nature of threat in proximity to those who can repress. It matters because of the nature of contacts. And it matters because of its cross cleavageness, if we can say that about urban spaces. And space matters. Space, its vastness, right? In spaces outside of cities, the ability to hide in different localities, as you said, and the tightness of space in cities. And violence and repertoires matter. And that's something I think is, you haven't talked as much about. But the presence and absence of the use of force, the even ideological willingness and comfort to use force on both the sides of those who rebel and those who contain those who rebel is a story throughout this book. And here's an interesting thing. More people had arms at hand in different periods of time. And as urbanization occurs, one of the things that also happens is there's fewer arms per individual over time. So your ability to get that sword or that hunting gun, for the most part, pistol in some cases, is also lessened, right? And that is a historical factoring element that changes your ability to even turn to violence. Because after all, I hope for the majority of you in the room, you would not know where to get a gun tomorrow to storm Whitehall, Westminster, right? And that is important. I can tell you where to go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm Ukrainian. I can also tell you where to go, but that's a different story. It's, no, but for the majority, and this, is, this, I think, is an element that is also important. But how about these two things? Space matters uh, here. Let's the tightness of space. And I was thinking of this. There's one section where you sh talk about Kiev and talk about... Uh, the, the, the spatiality of Kiev and how that altered the ability for a mass mobilization to occur in 2004. And for those who don't know, that's something that I've studied extensively. Uh, what I found very interesting is that the history of the use of different spaces for protest in Kiev is a little bit slightly more complicated than, than what you lay out in the paragraph and you couldn't have possibly can added more in there. But... Uh, it's interesting that in all of these civic urban revolutionary episodes, people tend to congregate 
in a physical space that leaves them even more exposed to threat and violence. But it is precisely when they do congregate in those either large avenues or squares that their threat to the government is also stronger because you can see their vastness. And that's an interesting paradox as well. And, and uh, I, I, you, I think you could have even you've done a little bit more there. But there's some questions remain, and I wouldn't be a nerdy political scientist if I didn't have them. Um, I think the first one, if you are interested in a deep dive overview of what people have said about revolution, revolutionary episodes, contentious politics in cities, mass mobilization, this is an incredible resource. And reminded me a lot of the things I had to learn in graduate school that I, 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 for, I tried to forget. <laughs> um, but the framing is a lot about discussions about revolutions, per se, and the outcomes of revolutions is also there, and what is and is not a revolution. And it's, although it's a wonderful source, one of the things that is, uh, I think, you know, and you do then, you do get to the point where you're actually, you're talking about revolutionary episodes, specifically, and then you focus on the moment element. Uh, but are those ever truly revolutions, right? And I think someone reading your book can't be fully sure in that sense. And there's something missing. So you have a revolutionary moment, episode. You have a revolution, which is the outcome, the, the massive changes of some nature, shape, or form. But you also tend to have a revolutionary moment. And the folks you cite, like Aya and Tilly, this is something very much they also talk about. And although it is mentioned, in different places. And that's kind of like the small storm brewing before it turns into the hurricane. And yet there should be, I think, a little bit more of it. And I'd like to hear a little bit more about how you understand the revolutionary movement and those actors that are the undertow before there is the massive wave, right? And they are there. They are there, and they are there differently when it comes to those social revolutions, and they are there differently when it comes to those urban civic revolutions. And perhaps, I have so many notes, but I'm going to just leave it off on a little stickler about Ukraine. It wouldn't be me if I didn't. Even though you didn't want to make this discussion about Ukraine, I'm going to go there. Um, I have a bone to pick with you. I disagree with you. I disagree strongly with you that these are not about democracy and that they're only negative coalitions. And I think, on average, they are. Um, but I don't think uh, that is entirely correct. And I do think there's a slight problem in terms of the data we, we employ. And this is the thing. This is exemplary data. This is exemplary analysis, right? I think except the surveys you use, and I'm going to focus on Ukraine, I, can't, I can do the same thing about Egypt or Tunisia. I, the, the folks know those contexts better than I do, even though I've done research on both those countries. The monitoring surveys. So one is conducted in 2005, just under two months, in fact, just over a month and a half after the moment of mass mobilization or the revolutionary episodes comes to an end. The other monitoring survey that you uh, employ in 2014, it's conducted almost five, if not more, months from the end of the revolutionary episode called the Yevromaidan. And one of the findings then you propose is that there is a smaller proportion of the civilian Ukrainian population that engages in the Yevromaidan, as reported in that latter survey, as compared to the first survey collected in 2005. I think there's really important issues here, and for, for the, the nature of the rigor of empirics in this book, Two things are important. First of the time, the temporal scope from talking to these people, and we all know that matters. But that is less of an issue for me as much as what happens in that time. When, that interview, when those interviews are conducted in 2005, that is a face of the euphoria of the revolutionary episode. You wanted to elevate, and more people wanted to say that they took part, especially if they were nationalist patriots, for instance. In the, uh, uh, in, the, in the Evromaidan case, you have war. You have war, interstate war, in June 2014. 
2014. Many Ukrainians at that point, not all, many come to see the Yevromaidan as the thing that produced the war and people depressed. And then in terms of the variety of things that you say about those people thereafter, I'm not quite sure if those are exactly the people. There are surveys conducted, obviously, on the Maidan. There are obviously many surveys conducted during the Maidan. And I'd like to ask, why didn't you use those? Um, and that's my little stigler. Thank you. Thank you very much. In the interest of fairness, I'm going to give Mark a chance to quickly respond um, to some of these criticisms and comments before we open it up to the sure. q &A. So how would you get arms? <laughs> you would go to the police station, right? Or you would go to the army base. That's how people actually who didn't have arms, you know, typically in the early 20th century, they got them from soldiers or they got them from, they stormed uh, police stations. Uh, that's what happened during the collapse of the Soviet Union. How did nationalist violence occur during the collapse of the Soviet Union? Violent, I mean, armed nationalist violence. It occurred because people stole weapons or they stormed the stores of weapons. So there's no reason why armed revolution couldn't take place today, even in an urban environment. It's just not tactically you know, feasible to some extent. You're outmanned, outgunned uh, by, uh, by the government. Uh, OK, so uh, in terms of space, I just want to say, and I don't know if I emphasize this in the talk, um, one of the things I show in the book is spatially in an urban revolution, uh, particularly an, ur an urban civic revolution that relies on the power of numbers, the closer that you're able to get to government centers of power, uh, the more likely you are to win because you're able to exert pressure uh, in a much uh, greater way. Uh, and you know, one of the strategies of regimes typically has been to disperse, uh, to keep, to peripheralize protest, to push it out to the outskirts of the city. Uh, you know, in Iran, famously, uh, this was pushed all the way to the rooftops of the city, right? So uh, this spatial control is really pretty critical. Um, so um, I will, let me just ask, I mean, I think one of the key points that Olya made uh, which is critical, I think, and it's, it's a subtle issue, is when does something become revolutionary? And how do, how do we know that it's revolutionary? And many of the episodes that we're talking about didn't start as revolutionary, right? They became revolutionary in the sense of articulating the goal of overthrowing the government, but also doing it in the form of a mass siege that is going out there and trying to force the government to, ch to change, to overthrow. It's not, revolution's not just a one-time demonstration going out and calling for the government you know, to step down. It's about going out there with some conviction to force a government to, set, to step down. You can do that by arms, you can do that by people, by numbers of people, but uh, that's in some ways the difference. And often that, that demand evolved, it developed, as a result of the interactions that occurred. So that's one of the, the points that I'm trying to make in that chapter on um, the hurricane, is that uh, you know, those interactions, particularly acts of repression, are often key in terms of turn, turning a situation that's not revolutionary into a revolutionary situation. There are other acts that governments can sometimes do too that have the similar types of effects, but these transformative moments uh, that change a uh, situation into being revolutionary. Uh, we need to pay much more attention to those moments. And it's not that they're not, this, this situation in society is not conducive to revolution. Structurally, it's happening where we would predict it to be. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, it wouldn't happen without those, those moments. So um, the surveys in Ukraine, uh, there were other surveys that I did. I did use the Keith survey in 2004, which was taken in the midst of the revolution. Um, and so in that case, it showed that, uh, you know, there was some difference in, in reporting, but not that much. 
Uh, and so the degree of preference falsification, at least in 2004, as to whether people participated wasn't that great. Um, so yes, it was a moment you know, of pride and uh, maybe there, and there was some degree of preference falsification, but I, you know, I do think that uh, even considering that, um, you know, the results do reflect something. Um, but you can't get around that. And I've also, I've looked at other, you know, I, I cite other surveys uh, in the book, um, you know, that were done uh, in, um, in other cases. And similar sorts of results are there. Uh, so, yes, there, is the, there are those issues. And yes, I could have used more. Uh, but then again, I had 500, I filled 550 pages worth of stuff. So uh, I think people maybe are thankful I didn't use too more. <laughs> Thank you very much to you both. Let us now open to um, take some questions from the live audience before we take a couple from the online audience. So I see, um, I see a gentleman there in the back. So somebody will come up to you with a microphone. It's the gentleman just here. Yeah, thank you so much for this incredible insights and for offering us actually a perspective that... Could you please speak up a little yeah. bit? Yeah, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Um, thank you for offering us the um, data set and the perspective that kind of organizes the pool of cases, in a sense, for us to actually even know how to place our own cases. Um, I'm going to ask you about an aspect that you did address in the book, but I felt like maybe we can hear more about um, from, inter, uh, from two related, interrelated points that you mentioned. Uh, within cities, uh, urban revolutions, uh, you mentioned that, first of all, violence fails uh, when it comes to cities in general, and that two-thirds uh, or three-fifths, I think, of all urban revolutions are urban civic. So what sort of variables mostly... Since 1985. Yes. Mm -hmm. What sort of variables, uh, in a sense, differentiate between these two types, the urban civic and the non-urban civic? Why do we see cases that fail to develop into the urban civic logic, in a sense? Um, is it regime type and repression? Is it different form of urbanization, the networks, um, or something else? Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's take another question if you're, if you're happy with grouping them. Um, the, the gentleman just there in the, in the, yes, on the side, yes. Yeah, thank you. Very insightful. Um, I just wonder, um, are revolutions only as effective as the trigger that instigates them? Um, that is, if there is um, a big enough of a trigger, they will inevitably succeed. And, and with that, I mean, what does failure look like for a revolution? Do they ever fail? Um, if they just manage to pick up at least one more person um, behind the crown, that in and it of it itself is a success, isn't it? Yeah, uh, what determines whether, an, or in the, let's say since 1985, whether a revolution becomes urban civic or whether it becomes, uh, or, or whether it remains, let's say, a riot um, or, uh, you know, uh, or armed, because there are still occasionally armed, armed rebellions, as I said, they, they have a, a high likelihood of failing. Um, Regime type is one of the features, uh, certainly. Um, certain types of regimes are much more vulnerable to urban civic uh, rebellion. The most repressive regimes, uh, most extremely repressive regimes, are, are less amenable to urban civic rebellion. Uh, and I show that to some extent, like the, that the um, the likelihood of success of the urban civic model against the most extremely repressive governments dips down below the level, the average level for all urban uh, revolutions. Um, so you would expect that, you know, to to be the case to some extent. Now uh, there are other types of regimes which also are less vulnerable to urban civic 
uh, revolutions. Uh, democracies are less vulnerable to urban civic revolutions, but they're less vulnerable to revolution more generally. Uh, so it's these regimes in between, the regimes in between. Um, and uh, the ones that are, are somewhat more repressive in between, they're the most vulnerable, the most vulnerable. The somewhat less repressive are much more easy, you know, they can co-opt more easily. So regime type is definitely one of the features. Uh, and, you know, I haven't looked specifically at the, you know, post-1985 to do a kind of an examination. So is, for instance, population size, urban, the degree of urban population? Um, yeah, I don't think that that's necessarily the case. I mean, the model also, there are other aspects besides just sort of the population size of cities that affect whether people will adopt this model. Uh, people learn, for instance. They emulate what's successful in other cases. Uh, sometimes they apply it to places which are inappropriate. Um, and sometimes they apply it to places that are inappropriate and they win, even though it's inappropriate, because regimes sometimes make mistakes. So the outcomes can be complex in terms of determining, you know, uh, what exactly uh, shifts the outcomes. Uh, part of it is structured, but part of it is not. Uh, but, you know, I think there are a number of factors that you, you'd have to look at, but it's a good question. And then the, the other one is, are revolutions only as effective as the degree of the trigger? You know, the, the, the intensity of maybe the anger that is created as a result of the trigger um, I think that's the nature of the question. Um, that's hard to tell because we don't know what the intensity of the anger is. Um, we don't really have good data to be able to compare that uh, very well. Um, and uh, certainly, you know, in urban revolutions, uh, there's the structural conduciveness, but but uh, there's uh, there are also uh, typical tr triggers that happen in many cases. Uh, so sometimes it's a trigger that's a, a stolen election. Sometimes it's a trigger of a financial crisis. Sometimes it's a trigger of, you know, yeah, within the context of economic pressure from outside, the prices of utilities are raised. Uh, you know, there are many different types of triggers that can set off an urban civic revolution. Uh, and it's not a, it's not a, a single thing. Um, but uh, sometimes it's not a trigger, but an opportunity that sets it off. So. Let's take a couple of questions from the online audience. Thank you. Katie, are you happy to read them out? Yeah, sure. Um, so we have three questions here. The first one is from Anna Frankel who says, who, you end by commenting on achievement of liberal democracy, but it is not clear that this is the aim of the revolutions you have studied. Are you able to assess to what degree participants achieve their aims, for example, the economic aims articulated in Egypt? Second question. From Kelly Steele. Please comment on implications of your conclusions for current pro-democracy movements in the United States. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Mm -hmm. And just... last one from Stuart McIver. Would it be possible, based on your findings, to emotionlessly engineer urban revolutions? Sorry, could you repeat that? Would it be, Would it be possible, based on your findings, to emotionlessly engineer urban revolutions. <laughs> Thank Can you. I just uh, use my prerogative as chair and sort of piggyback on some of these questions and something that I kept thinking about. Essentially, Mark, unfortunately, it's a very pessimistic account, not because you know, you, you're of your own kind of predispositions, but because of the, the, the nature of the findings. And I'm thinking, looking ahead, uh, living in Britain where you know we have laws uh, criminalizing, you know, environmental protesters who uh, engage in certain acts and, and the governments, 
even in democracies, becoming ever more ingenious in finding ways to criminalize, penalize, suppress dissent. And, and from your findings, we also learn about the, the negative coalition, the ineffectiveness of kind of goal achievement when it comes to, for instance, reducing corruption. Is there any room for optimism? Or are these people who take to the streets, are they wasting their time? Uh, not necessarily. So one of the things that I, I, I try to uh, bring out is that it's not the revolution itself that would make a democracy or that would achieve the ends that we're talking about. It's what happens after the revolution. And we pay so much less attention to that and to what allows a regime to make achievements in the wake of revolution. This is where the Ukraine example does make an effect uh, or, or should, should be uh, thought of. But there are other cases also that have made achievements, significant achievements. I mean, achievements after revolution are hard fought and difficult, um, much more difficult than people imagine. Revolutions always lead to some degree of disappointment, and they always, of course, raise hopes enormously. But some regimes, particularly those that have been able to hold their revolutionary coalitions together after revolution, often as a result of external incentives, sometimes not induced uh, with that purpose in mind. Uh, but for instance, in Ukraine, you know, the invasion uh, that occurred uh, in 2014 of Crimea, the annexation of Crimea, induced a, 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 a sense that you know, this new regime needs, needed to tackle issues in a bigger way. And of course, that consolidated eventually over time and in frustration over that. But there were external incentives that were created in Ukraine. In other, other cases in Eastern Europe that were more successful in making achievements also had that external incentive to escape, uh, in fact, Russian domination. And those external incentives were particularly, they tended to be lacking in the Arab Spring revolutions. Uh, a sense of that. So I think that, there are, that you know, holding a revolutionary coalition together uh, and creating consensus is very important. And if you look at examples like you know, in uh, uh, Egypt, for instance, that, that, that was a, a critical mistake. And often re revolutionary regimes are under pressure to do things quickly for their own coalitions, right, if they come to power. So you can understand why those mistakes are made, but at the same time, they can have pretty big consequences. Um, so, uh, so to what extent have other aims, the, the aims that people might have <clears throat> been achieved as a result? Well, again, it, it is a matter of a long struggle, typically. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, it, it is a protracted struggle to achieve those aims. And so, uh, you know, you, uh, if we think about, for instance, corruption as one of the chief issues that motivates, um, motivates these revolutions um, and repression, uh, so particularly in terms of corruption, that's difficult to tackle. It takes a long time to tackle. It requires consensus over that. It often, you know, so I, I think that, um, you know, there have been cases of states that have successfully tackled corruption. Uh, but then again, there's a tendency for backtracking often um, that can happen. And that certainly was the case in, let's say, for instance, uh, Georgia, which engaged in a lot of anti-corruption measures after its Rose Revolution attempt, in fact, uh, you know, wiped it out. But then again, then they're, they're, they're more recently uh, backtracking. Uh, so, uh, can revolutions be engineered? Emotionlessly. Emotionlessly. Mo emotionlessly. <laughs> no, you'd have to do it with emotion, for one thing. <laughs> but if you did decide to do that, um, I think it would be very difficult to totally engineer it. Now, that doesn't mean that the external environment doesn't play an important role in, um, in revolution. Uh, sometimes a little bit of resources from, from outside can make a big difference within uh, revolutionary contention. Uh, but at the same time, you can't 
engineer mass revolt. Uh, it's enormously risky for people to engage in mass revolt. Uh, and so, you know, this is something that um, I think people who tend to, for, for instance, say, oh, well, the color revolutions were simply the invention of the United States. No, oh, yeah, the United States did, and I've written about this, the United States did play a role in, you know, stimulating uh, those revolutions, providing some critical resources. But you can't manufacture mass participation. That just doesn't happen. And people taking those risks on the street. So revolutions cannot be engineered. They can be facilitated. I think I would say that. Mm -hmm. Let's take another round of uh, questions. Maybe some from, I'd like to, uh, some of the a question from the ladies. <coughs> Anybody? You can privately message us. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you for the lecture. I was wondering. Um, now I lost it. I need to look for it. So um, you talked about how architecture affects the spaces that are available for people who want to participate in the revolution. Um, and I think that governments probably would have studied this as well. So when um, there is urban planning or like countries decide to move the capital, let's say for like Brazil, they move to um, Brasilia, um, what principles do they keep in mind when they're building the architecture? So, uh, you know, often, uh, so yes, one of one of the key things is to try to move the capital. I, I go through this in my in a chapter in the book of the types of strategies that regimes take to try to revolution-proof their cities. Um, and you can do many different things. You can commercialize certain spaces that people, you know, uh, might use for revolution. You can regulate spaces in a serious way so that people can't come. You can, you know, in Russia they gave them a Hyde Park where they could go protest, you know, way outside the city in the middle of the woods. Uh, so moving the capital is a very costly way to do it, but many regimes have done this. And of course, it's being done in Cairo as well. Uh, so what do they do when they, tr when they move the capital? Well, largely, it's to get away from rebellious populations. And ironically, they create very similar types of spaces in these cities. Often they're grand spaces with large open, um, you know, large open areas, uh, in part because they're interested in glorifying themselves. They create those spaces to do that, right? Um, you know, if you look historically, these, you know, the development of these spaces, historically in Europe, for instance, those spaces were market areas. They had to be raised to make them open spaces. Uh, they were filled with, I mean, if you look in Moscow, for instance, you know, you, you look at Manier Square, it was filled with all sorts of booths and, you know, religious things and so on. And it had to be cleared to make it into a space that the regime uh, turned into a uh, Turned, turned into a space for glorification of the regime. So uh, there is this tendency of regimes to want to do that. Now, I mean, a, an interesting example is, of course, Saudi Arabia, which is creating this linear city. And you think about the implications of what's a linear city for people to be able to gather together, uh, to engage in, pe in the people power type of rebellion, much harder. Much harder. So uh, I don't know where sociality will happen in that kind of city, but but uh, in in essence, uh, they are constantly engaged in these types of tactics of trying to revolution-proof cities, and it can be done in other ways. You know, uh, you you can, uh, uh, for instance, uh, just simply forbid people from even treading on a particular space, and that's done in many places. So I remember, for instance, Manier Square uh, in Moscow, which was the vast space where the largest demonstration in Russian history ever took place. 
uh, in you know 1991. Uh, you know that that space was forbidden. You could not walk on that space during the Soviet period. The police were there; they would chase you away. Um, it was not you know so those kinds of controls are um, widely used. Unfortunately, I think we've run out of time, and I know that the online session will be cut off automatically um, at 8 o'clock, which I think we're a few minutes past that. And I also know that some of you will want to purchase that book, and hopefully uh, Mark will give a few minutes and will be, would be happy to sign it. Uh, but please join me in giving uh, Mark and Ola a round of applause for a really stimulating discussion.